Uh, we're in a series called Promises. If you haven't been here and you'd like to get caught up in week one, we really laid uh, the foundation of the concept that we're gonna be talking about for the rest of this series. And we have that up on our website at citychurchwest.com. Citychurchwest.com, you can click on the watch tab at the top of the screen. Uh, or if you're on your smartphone, you can do the little pull down list and click watch. And you get caught up. Uh, also, if you want to invite friends or loved ones to the service and want them to kind of be caught up and know the big concept we're talking about, you can send them to citychurchwest.com. We're rooting this entire series out of the book of 2 Peter, which is in the New Testament of our Bibles. The apostle Peter was writing this letter to a group of believers, and he said this. He said, because of their faith in Jesus, that God has given us his very great and precious promises and this is good news because we've been talking about trying to live a life of significance a life that truly matters and over now about 10 years of ministry and talking with and pastoring countless people the most common thing I hear is this desire for people's lives to matter they want to know their purpose they want to understand why they're on planet earth and their fear is that they're going to get to the end of their life they're going to be six feet in the ground a few people will be sad but they'll probably eventually get over it and they will have left no mark on this world and so it's complicated by the world offering us many different paths that come attached with a promise of significance. If you can just lose the weight or if you can go down this path and get the perfect spouse and have the kids and buy the house and drive the car and wear the right brands, then you will finally live the life that you've been longing for. But if you live long enough and if you go to the end of enough of these paths, what you realize is that they ultimately do not meet this deep inner longing for significance. And so Peter says that God has given us his own very great and precious promises. And wherever you're at in your life, it may be time to consider looking to God's promises instead of the promises that are around us in this world. And Peter doesn't just tell us about these promises. He then lays out this list, which acts as the roadmap that we're walking down in this series of how we can actually get to this kind of life. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, add to your perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly affection and to brotherly affection love. Now this is a lot and it's why we're taking six weeks to go through this list piece by peace. One more important thing before we really get going today, if you haven't been with us, uh, one of the things that strikes us about this list is it's not a list of verbs. It's not an action-oriented list. This is not a performance-based system. We're calling this a list of postures. Posture is about your inner life. It's about your mind frame and how you view the world. It's your emotion and your will and the standards that you set for yourself internally. Really what Peter is saying and the big idea for our series is that your posture unleashes the power of God's promise. Say that with me. Your posture unleashes the power of God's promises. And so today we're going to continue down our roadmap and we're going to be looking at the posture of knowledge. Now, some of you know, you've heard me talk about it before, um, that I have a worship band that I do uh, from time to time. Uh, the vast majority of my attention stays focused on what we're doing at City West, uh, but there's a group of us who get together. We travel mostly around Texas, sometimes in some adjoining states, and, uh, and we'll go and we'll lead camps or retreats. We do a lot of stuff uh, for youth groups who will come together, and we lead worship for these events. And it, it really is a, a, a great gig, and it's a lot of fun, and I shouldn't complain about getting paid to strum a guitar, but I'm, I'm going to, because I'm not gonna lie, uh, it can get pretty boring being on the road. Um, if we're playing a five-day camp, we may play a total of an hour of music, and the other 23 hours is basically us sitting in a room looking at each other. And so, out of this boredom, some pretty amazing things have happened. Uh, we kind of started this routine of betting each other to do ridiculous things for small sums of money. Now, don't leave yet. It gets worse. Um, for example, one time we were playing in a football stadium. We were in San Angelo. We were gonna play at San Angelo Stadium. We were gonna be down on the field and we got there early to set up and we were a little too early and so the cross country team, a collegiate athletes, was still running. And they were running 
quarters or, or laps. And uh, from the stands, it doesn't look like they're going very fast. Uh, but if you put a clock to it, they were running about 51 or 52 second laps. Now, if you're still unimpressed by that, I'd love for you to go to Walmart, buy a stopwatch, find a track after service, and just see where you land running one lap. <laughs> 51 seconds is incredibly fast. Now, we started wondering if we would be able to keep up with this group of people. Noel, our worship pastor, is in my band, and he felt pretty confident in his ability to run one lap with this group of people. Now this was several years ago when his beard was about this long and uh, he was in his cowboy boots and his jeans. Um, and, and the thing I love about Noel is to get him to do something, what you really have to do is just say, I bet you can't. <laughs> so we put a few dollars on it and uh, the shock on the cross country team's face when Noel joined them on their 400. <laughs> Uh, was worth all the money in the world, only to be topped by about 300 meters in his trip and his fall, which landed with his boots up in the air. So I thought, there's got to be a more efficient way to do this. And in February, we were traveling out to West Texas for a few days to play some events, and I decided to institute a dollar bet policy in my band. And it's pretty simple. Throughout our time on the road, uh, I will challenge the guys in the band to do things that are ridiculous or really that I just think will be entertaining. And if they take the bet, then at the end of the event, I add a dollar to their paycheck for everyone that, that, that they take. And I gotta tell you, it's pretty incredible what people will do for one dollar. Um, <laughs> it's made life on the road a lot better. And maybe, maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you have friends who throw down money on stuff every once in a while. Uh, you know, I, I bet you can't get this person's number. I bet you can't do a certain number of push-ups. Maybe you put down some money on the big game or who's going to win today or the Vikings going to be able to do it. Uh, someone's got some money on the game right here. <laughs> And, uh, and, and here's the deal. As your pastor, I just want to officially say that I am not endorsing gambling in any way. I do want to say, though, $5 can make a game of Uno really come to life, okay? <laughs> so maybe, maybe you can relate to that. And maybe, maybe you're like me, where there are some people in my life, acquaintances or even friends, who I would never bet with. I just know better. And there's a reason. It's because you should only take a bet from a, a person that you trust. And you can only really trust people that you actually know. And so my band, over the years, has consistently gotten paychecks at the end of every event. And I've tried to take care of them and cover meals. They know me. And so when I institute a dollar bet challenge, they're down to take some of the bets because they know that I'm good for it. Their knowledge of me as a person made it safe to take the bet. And really... What any gamble comes down to, what any bet comes down to, is a promise. You're being challenged to go through a process because there's a promise of the reward at the end. And if you take the bet, then you're believing in the promise and you begin to walk in light of it. And so it really comes down to how well you know the person. And how it works is the higher the wager, the more trust you should have with whoever you're dealing with. Completing a $5 bet and not getting the $5, that's pretty minimal. But betting your life savings uh, on, on like a surefire investment that goes bust, that can be catastrophic. And so some of you feel like this whole conversation is a little adolescent. You didn't come to church to hear about your pastor's gambling issues. But I wanna suggest that whoever you are and however you feel about it, uh, that everyone gambles. And it may not be with money and it may not be over the big game, but anytime we come to points in our lives where we have important decisions to make, there's always risk and there's always reward. And whichever way we decide to go on our decisions is a gamble. We are betting that it will work out for us. So quickly, let me give you a few examples that I actually have some statistics to back me up on. Statistically, I can say safely that the majority, maybe not the vast majority, but at least a 51% of the 18 to 40 year olds in this room are not actively saving for retirement. That's just their statistics on this. 18 to 40 year olds, millennials, and, and most Gen Xers are not saving for retirement. And so, let me frame what you're doing in the conversation we're having. You are betting your future on social security to be able to take care of you. And when it comes to taking a bet, you have to trust 
the institution and to trust something, you have to really know it. So for those of you who aren't saving for retirement, my question for you is do you know the US government enough to trust them to take care of you in your old age? And you know what? Maybe no one gets anything spiritual out of today, but someone's gonna open a retirement account tomorrow. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about marriage in this series. And uh, marriage comes with the promise that your spouse will make your life complete and give you bliss and happiness and, and you'll have kids and you'll have sexual intimacy and you'll have all of these amazing things. Now we know statistically that around half of marriages are ending in divorce, so it already seems like a big gamble. But I wanna hit you with some more very interesting statistics. Did you know that people who date for at least two years have almost double the chance of staying married till the end as someone who dates less than two years? Even more interesting, people who complete three years of dating have a 70% higher chance of staying married to the end than people who only dated for two years. Because spending the rest of your life with someone is a huge gamble, and to take a bet, you have to trust someone, and to trust them, you have to take some time to get to know them. So what I'm saying is that often we think of taking a bet as action-oriented. We think it's about performance, if I complete the challenge, if they win the game, if I do the push-ups, if I get the number, if, if I win the competition. But really, it doesn't start with performance. It starts with an internal decision of whether or not you trust the person enough to take them up on their bet. And the higher the stakes, the more you should know. And I believe this is why Peter asks us to add to our faith virtue and to our virtue, knowledge. Uh, Today, Peter moves on to knowledge. Knowledge uh, in the Greek that Peter originally wrote this letter in is the word gnosis. Now, gnosis, every time it's used in the scripture, doesn't simply mean knowledge. It always means the knowledge of God. And I'd like to point out that this list is not a list of actions. Knowledge is not a verb. You can't knowledge something. You weren't late for work because you were up knowledging. That doesn't even sound appropriate. Knowledge is something internal, and we're talking about taking on a posture of knowledge. We're gonna look at a short story from the Old Testament today to see what it looks like to add knowledge to our faith. Now, last week, we talked about how the Old Testament is the history of the Jewish people, the Israelites. And the Israelites were God's chosen people for a span of time. It's how he revealed himself to the world. It's how he was working out his plan for history. And the Israelites had been given incredible promise. And from time to time, they would walk powerfully in these promises. And sometimes they would get distracted and they would live very very difficult lives. We're gonna be in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, which tells the history of Israel from the perspective of the men who ruled it, and we're coming in at a very tough time in their history. What was happening is there had been a few evil kings who had come to power. The first king was named Manasseh, and Manasseh was a bad dude. He reigned for 55 years, which gave him five and a half decades of influencing the Israelite people and leading them astray. Manasseh instituted things like idolatry, prostitution, he desecrated the temple of God, and he tried to live by his own performance. After Manasseh died, his son, King Amon, took over, and Amon might have even been more evil than Manasseh. However, uh, his reign was short-lived. He was so evil that even his own officials conspired against him and had him killed. And so when King Amon died, the kingdom was left in the hands of his son Josiah, who was only eight years old. I have an eight-year-old. My son's name is Paxton. We don't let that fool walk around the block by himself. <laughs> Josiah was running a country. And here's the craziest part. After coming from a lineage of evil kings and starting at such a young age, he was running it pretty well. In 2 Kings 22, we see that Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. His mother's name was, was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah. She was from Bozkat. There'll be a, a quiz on those names, so pay attention. Uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed completely the ways of his ancestor, King David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. And how incredible is that? That coming from his historical heritage, his father, his grandfather, that Josiah steps up at such a young age and in such a big way. It, it shows that 
Josiah had the faith to follow God. And it also shows that he had virtue. It says he would not be swayed to the right or to the left. He had the courage to stay the path and he had a standard of excellence for himself and for his country. He had faith and he had added to his faith virtue. However, Israel was still in a tough place. They were still wrapped up in idolatry. The temple was full of idols. The people were not pursuing their potential or understanding their purpose. They weren't walking powerfully in the promises of God. Until one day, in the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent his secretary to the temple of the Lord. And Hilkai, the high priest, said to the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to the secretary, who read it out loud to King Josiah. This is a huge deal. What, what they're calling the book of the law here is the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And for hundreds of years, the book of the law had guided and governed the Israelite people, and it led them to posture themselves to walk powerfully in God's promises. But over the reign of two evil kings, it had been lost back in some corner of the temple, covered up by idols. And during King Josiah's reign, it's found and it's read aloud to him. Now, at this point, 18 years in, King Josiah is a 26-year-old. He's been the king for almost 20 years. He creates the laws. He makes the rules. What he says goes, and all of a sudden, he has a situation where either he can puff up his chest, say, I've got this, I'm doing a pretty good job, I've got faith, I've got virtue, I will continue making the law, or he can submit to the law of the Lord. And we see his response in verse 11, it says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Now, tearing your robes was a traditional sign of mourning. Josiah began to deeply grieve. I did something last week that uh, I've never done in my adult life. I may have done it as a kid uh, before. I'd have to ask my parents. I'm really not sure. Uh, but in my adult life, I have never done this. I did it last week. I went to the eye doctor. And you'll never guess what happened. That's a joke because I'm wearing glasses, so you can see what happened already. I got glasses. It turns out uh, I have uh, an astigmatism in my eye. And it, I shouldn't be surprised because my mom has an astigmatism and so does my dad. And uh, I know some of their parents wore glasses as well. And my sister is basically blind. She has to wear glasses as well. She has terrible vision. And to be honest, mine is not that bad. I have a pretty light prescription, not a huge deal. I hadn't been a danger on the road or anything before I had these glasses. But even with, with a pretty light prescription, uh, I was at Target, my, my kids, some of my kids were with me, and uh, I, this, this sermon's not sponsored by Target, it's just where I bought my glasses. <laughs> and I went in, the, the optical place is at the front of the store, and they, they got my glasses, and they took them out of the little case, and they cleaned them off, and I put them on, for whatever reason, I put them on facing the very back of Target, and when, when they hit my eyes, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> is this is what, this is what the world really looks like. Like I just started reading the signs in the back. Towels, oh, to dairy. There's the dairy section right there. It was incredible, I was seeing so well for the first time. You see, Josiah had faith to follow God and he had virtue, he had excellence and courage to do the right thing, but for some reason Israel still wasn't really walking in the promises of God and he couldn't really see it and really understand the potential because he couldn't really see the promises until he had the corrective lens of scripture. It wasn't until he got into God's word and started seeing his life and the world around him the way that God sees it that he could see the promises and posture himself to walk powerfully in them. And, and it got me to thinking as I'm putting my glasses on and, and I'm, man, y'all are so good looking. I never knew. I started thinking about some things. I, I thought about my little problem and tiny prescription. I thought about the blind man and Jesus touched his eyes and he'd been blind since birth and then he opened him up and for the first time he saw 2020 and I, and I thought about Josiah who wanted to be a great king and wanted to lead his nation back to God. He just didn't have the right lenses. 
And when he saw the world through the eyes of scripture, everything came into focus. And I think for some of us, maybe you're here today and you're not a believer, maybe you're from a different faith background or you consider yourself an agnostic or maybe even atheist and you're wondering how this world is ever gonna make sense. You're searching or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but it just seems like a struggle. You don't really understand God's purpose for you. You don't feel like you're pursuing your potential. We talk about joining the movement and you're trying, but you just don't really see any success. You don't see any impact or any difference. And maybe what it is, is that you don't need better performance. Maybe you just have a spiritual astigmatism. Maybe you're just simply not seeing promises of God in 2020 because you're not looking at it through the lens of his word. And what I realized is that what God was saying to the blind man and what God was saying to King Josiah and what God is saying to us today is that I, I, I'm not just here to help you see, I am what you see. Yeah. If we just posture ourselves for knowledge, this insatiable desire to know more about God, who he is and what he wants to do with our life, then we will get to see life clearly through the corrective lens of his word. This is what happened to Josiah. It became evident to him that they could never really experience the promises of God in their current state. So here's what he did. He went to the temple of the Lord with all of the people from least to greatest. He read in their hearing, all of the words of all five books of the covenant. Some of y'all get a little mad when we're four minutes over here at CWS. He read every word from every book of the covenant. And then the king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commands. And all the people pledged themselves to the covenant as well. You know what he did as soon as he found the book of the law? He got everyone to meet together so that they could move together. And not only that, but Josiah started applying what he believed. He got a crew together. They went all through the land, destroying the idols that had been put up, burning them and scattering the ashes. Josiah got things right. He began to lead an entire nation of people back to walking powerfully in the promises of God. And Josiah has gone down as one of the greatest kings in Israel. His name is up there with people like King David and King Solomon. And that's what we want. We want our lives to matter. So what did we see about Josiah? He came into his reign with faith. He already had virtue, but it was not until he postured himself with knowledge, till he saw the world through the lens of scripture that it really made the difference. Josiah was king. He could have done whatever he wanted. He could have just bet on his own performance to lead people out of the state that they were in but he understood what we are so desperately trying to understand here, that it's not your performance, it is your posture that unleashes the power of God's promises in your life. Now listen, Josiah was postured for knowledge. That did not happen when the book of the law was found. It happened sometime earlier in his life and because of that posture, there was no way he was gonna go any other route but to live by the word of God. And here's why this matters to you today. God is challenging you to live the life that you were created to live, to go against the culture, to go against the status quo. He's asking you to stop thinking that your life is somehow about your ability to perform, but to posture yourself. God is asking you to bet your life, not on all the shiny things in this world, but to ultimately bet your life on his promises, to believe it, and to walk powerfully in light of it. But the reality is, we've said from the beginning of our time together today, that taking a bet comes down to trust, and you can't trust someone that you do not know. And so if you're not actively seeking God, and actively in his word, talking to him in prayer, calling on his spirit, then when life gets hard, or when distractions come, then instead of looking to what becomes clear through the lens of scripture, we will look to the things of this world. Can I tell you a secret? I didn't tell 848, but I'll tell you. I just ran out of time. 
Uh, I've known I needed glasses for a long time. I've known it. And I knew it because I couldn't read the towel sign in the back of Target, but I also knew it because every once in a while when I was really tired or I liked to read when I had read a lot, um, I, I would go to a, a state of vision where I could see virtually nothing. Uh, I couldn't see my phone to text my wife, like, help me, I'm blind. I couldn't, I couldn't drive. My team here at City West, the, the staff here got to experience it on a retreat and we stayed up late dreaming about what God was gonna do here at City West several nights in a row. And, and we were on the ride back, thank God I wasn't driving and this happened. And, and, and my team got to see me in a full on panic attack um, be, because the world became so incredibly blurry. And so when I went to the eye doctor, what I learned is that even though I, I have vision trouble, that my brain has been compensating for it and would help me focus and it was great. And so I could get by and I didn't really need the glasses and I didn't want to spend the money buying the glasses and I didn't want them to do the puff the air thing into my eyeball at, at the optometrist. And so I just, I would just wing it. But from time to time, I would get too exhausted and my brain would check out for a little while and say, you're on your own eyes and I could see nothing. And I think a lot of people are living their life and you come on Sunday and you hear about the promises and you know you need it in your life, but you get out in the real world and you're compensating well enough. Maybe you, maybe you can't see the very back of the store, but you can still drive. You're not really a hazard to others. You, you don't want to take the time to do the work, to go get the help that you need. You don't want to spend the money on the corrective lenses. And so you just allow yourself to exist hoping that the promises of the world will carry you through. And every once in a while, you're going to get too tired, too exhausted. And you will feel like you are blind, shuffling your way through this life. And so today we have an opportunity to posture ourselves for knowledge, to call out to God, to have this insatiable desire, this hunger to know who God is and what he's about and what he wants for our life. People say, I don't know my purpose and, and I'm not on the path to my potential and I don't know what God wants out of my life. And nine times out of 10, when you ask them if they're reading his word, the answer is no. How can you see the promises if you're not looking through the correct lens? And here's the danger is, is we're so performance-based that we say, all right, I'm gonna do it. And so we get the Bible or we download the app and we buy the one-year devotional. And for a couple weeks in a row, we wake up early and we set our alarms and we, we make our coffee and we put on some K-Love and we start reading, but we're thinking performance-based and we're white-knuckling it, trying to make it through our devotional and then life gets hard and you get busy and you wake up one day and you're four years into your one-year devotional because we fell into the trap of a performance-based system. And really, it has to start with your posture. And if you will posture yourself and ask God to give you a desire to know him more and more, and you take on that posture of knowledge, then getting up and reading your Bible and spending time with God in prayer will become the easiest part of your day. And the more that you read, the more you'll trust him. And the more that you trust him, the more that you'll believe his promises and take his bet to posture yourself even more for the pursuit of his knowledge, which will lead you to more reading and more praying. And it becomes this beautiful cycle where God begins to unleash Leave something inside of you and you begin to walk powerfully in the promises of God. It doesn't start with our performance. It starts with our posture. Now I want to end today by filling in a gap in the story. I'll, I'll go quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, if you're like me, you may be wondering how Josiah coming from an evil father, an evil grandfather, inheriting a kingdom full of idolatry and evil that was taking place, naturally had this posture of faith and virtue and knowledge. And the answer is actually in the text. We've already read it, but it's easy to miss. In verse one, it says Josiah was eight. When he became king, he reigned for 31 years. And his mother's name was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah. You know, women don't get mentioned a lot in history books back in this time. Women didn't really have position of prominence. They weren't uh, really viewed very highly, unfortunately, in, in culture. 
But Josiah's mother gets mentioned, and they say it almost like we should know who it is. Oh, his mother was Jedidah. Like if I said, oh, yeah, no, that, that's, 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 uh, that's Billy. You know, his mom's Eva Longoria. And you'd go, oh, Eva Longoria, we love her. They just kind of casually mention it. Josiah, his mother was Jedidah. And I thought, who is this lady? And I did some research, and what I realized is that Jedidah is a descendant of a man named Caleb. And Caleb you may have heard about in the story of the Exodus when Moses leads the people out of Egypt, Egyptian slavery and into the promised land. And before they get to the promised land, a man steps up and his name is Caleb and he proves himself to be postured to walk powerfully in the promises of God. And he's known as a spiritual hero in the scriptures. And then it clicked. Of course, even though Josiah came from a lineage of evil and even though he had a historical heritage and he inherited a mess where people were worshiping idols, of course he could posture himself the right way to get in touch with God, to submit to the scriptures because his mama taught him to do that. And all of a sudden it all makes sense. And and the last part of the story made me think about Proverbs 22 where it says, start children off on the way they should go and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. And I think, I think we're going to do some pretty cool things here at City West. I think we're going to continue to grow. We might have other locations. We're going to have impact. We're going to reach lots of people. But the greatest legacy we could ever have is the 200 kids that sit on the other side of this wall every week. If they grew up surrounded by adults who let go of the performance-based system and postured themselves to walk powerfully in God's promises and met together consistently and prioritized it over all of the other things in this world and moved powerfully together out in our community and the world around us was different. What if we grew up a generation of people who it was just natural for them to posture themselves because their parents and their community here at City West have led them into that place? To me, that is the greatest legacy see we could leave behind this is about more than just you and I getting this right and scratching the itch of significance this is about the people coming behind us And so you have opportunities to join alongside of us. You have opportunities to have impact in your normal rhythm of life, where you work, where you work out, in your community, your neighborhood, the clubs that you're in, the people you hang out with, the restaurants you eat at consistently. You have opportunity for impact right here at City West. We're signing people up to go back there and to love on our kids and to hold our babies and to show them an example of people who are living in the promises of God. We need people to tear down chairs. We need people to roast coffee. We need people to step up and set an example for our future generation. Why do we have to get to church so early every day, mom? It's because we're serving God and we're serving people. Let's lay a foundation, not just to reach our potential in our life, but so that the people coming behind us, these precious kids back here, will do the same. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you this is not a performance-based system because we would fall so short. God, I ask that you would just give us the motivation and the understanding to posture ourselves, to add to our faith virtue, to our virtue knowledge. God, as we continue walking down this roadmap that you've given us in your word, I pray that we would get into your word and we would see our life and the lives of those around us through the lens of your scripture. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.